the Faith Apostolic Church of Troy this morning. And she was here right back there. I don't know if they, oh, there, there, you had just moved over. Okay. We're just so glad you're here, LaVita. And we, I saw some other guests. I may have been first time. If you're a first time guest here and they didn't get your name up to me yet, would you just stand up? Because we're just so uh, honored to have any other first time guests. I thought you were, this is the first time you were here and I didn't get your name and I'm so sorry I can't call your name, but we're so glad you're here. Now let's give a welcome hand to all that are viewing on the World Wide Webcast that we're just so glad they're joining this service live with us this morning. It's such a, a blessing to be a part of joint worship in the family of God. I, 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 just, uh, I just feel to tell you to stand because I'm going to read the Word of God in a moment. We want to stand in honor of the Word of God. I know you've stood a lot already. And if you can't stand, if you're not able, we understand that, of course. You don't have to try to get up if you're not able. But, you know, I just felt that I am not supposed to just go right into my Scripture reading in the message. There's something God is, I believe, wanting to do right now before I preach by the Spirit. And I feel to ask you to do something we haven't done in a while, and that is to ask the body to minister to the body. Now, I know we already had that time up here during our prayer time where the body was ministering to the body, but, but I just felt a pause of the Holy Ghost as I went back and when I saw Sister Carly wasn't on this list to sing and I thought she was singing and she couldn't because of, of the weekend. But as I was walking back down the aisle, I felt the Lord just say, pause, son, and let me just work right now in my spirit. So I, I just want, if you have a need, maybe it's a physical need, maybe it's not a physical need. I, I just feel like God is wanting us to just exercise some faith and everybody say body ministry. Some faith and body ministry in the house this morning before I go into the Word of God. So if you have any kind of a need that you're feeling as I'm saying this, that it might be about something that is a need in your life, would you just step out into the aisle right where you are? Just out into the aisle right where you are. I just feel like God is going to do some things right before we go into the Word of God. I, I, I believe God's going to minister, and I'm feeling that in the Holy Ghost, and I, I want to follow that. I don't want us ever to just be so geared to what's on our service schedule that we can't hear the, the voice of the Lord just guide us in a way he wants. Now, you see people that are in those aisles. Stay in those aisles if you have that need. And I want you to go to people that are standing in those aisles. You just pray right now and ask the Lord to direct you to who, to whom you should go, who you should go pray for right now. And, and we're going to believe God to do some work in body ministry, just the body ministering to the body right now. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, I, I feel like you directed me to come right here and to pray for Sister Hoover. Lord, I don't know what this is about, but I don't have to know. You know. You know. You see. You see it inside and out. You see it in ways we are incapable of seeing it, Lord. But I am asking you to move. I'm asking you to work. I'm asking you to release virtue. I'm asking you to release wisdom. I'm asking you to release circumstantial help, Lord. Circumstantial help in this need. Bring your, your power and your wisdom and and you're working into this situation, Lord. And I'm praying for Sister Lee that you would bless, that you would cover, that you would move. Lord, we're, we're just wanting your answers and your guidance and your, your 
that work of your spirit, Lord, that is beyond what we can do, even beyond what we can figure out or understand, but it's never, no situation is ever beyond your touch. It's never beyond, it's never in a, a realm beyond what you can reach and do and work in by your spirit, for you have said, the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And I am asking you to move and work in this need by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Let's all just lift our hands and our voices with praise to the Lord right now and just honor His presence. Entertain His presence. Entertain this flow of the Spirit of God. It just comes when His body ministers to itself through the Spirit. Thank you, precious Lord. We love you and we thank you. We love you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, precious Lord. Thank you, precious Lord. Thank you, precious Lord. Mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy name, Lord. Praise your holy name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. Oh, your precious spirit, Lord, your precious spirit. 
Oh, Lord Jesus, your precious spirit, the flow of your precious spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, your work, Lord. Your flow. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want us to pray right now for all the people in North and South Carolina that have been affected. We didn't do that last week. It was Youth Power Week, and we, we didn't do that. But I think it's appropriate right now in this flow of the Spirit that we pray for all of the people. There are many people in our churches, but we're not just praying for the people in our churches. We're praying for all the people that have been affected so adversely by, by this hurricane that hit, hit the East Coast. And, and they're still, it's been worse since the hurricane passed for them with the rivers uh, rising and the flooding that has taken place. Would you just take the hand of someone near you if it's appropriate and let's, let's pray for all the people affected in, in these two states. Some of them uh, have lost nearly everything. Some of them still don't know what they still have or what they've lost, but let's pray for them. Lord Jesus, we are just agreeing, Lord, for all of these people that have been impacted by this hurricane and the resultant storms and the resultant flooding. We're holding them up before you, Lord. I hold Roy's church up to you, Lord, in Lumberton. And I pray that you would cause that river to recede, Lord. I'm praying for the pastor in New Bern, Lord, that you would cover the people there, the church there. I'm asking you, Lord, to cover the people. I don't even know the specific ones to call. I know Roy Barnhill. I know the pastor in New Bern. I, I know to call their their name specifically before you, but Lord, I don't know all of the names of the people to call, but you see them, Lord, and I'm asking you to move. I'm asking you to flow. I'm asking you to help them, Lord. I'm asking you to cause them to be able to recover, Lord. In the name of Jesus, bless them. I'm sorry for the life that has been lost, Lord. I'm asking you would you help there to be no more loss of life, Lord? And would there be some way you will work through the ravages of this storm to get yourself glory and to draw people closer to you, to draw them closer to you through having walked through this storm? In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, precious Jesus. Oh, let's just entertain the presence of the Lord here. I don't, just not, the Lord's not letting me go forward yet. Lord Jesus, I, I just want you to do everything in this service that you have seen in your will and your plan and your purpose you're wanting to do, Lord. We know, Lord, that it is all about you and you accomplishing your will, you accomplishing your purposes, you, Lord Jesus, moving and working in our spirits and in our minds and in our lives, Lord, as only you can do, Lord. Thank you, precious Jesus. Thank you, precious Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just feel that we're to pray right now for our general conference coming up this week. It begins Tuesday night in Louisville, Kentucky. 
And let's just pray for the will of God in everything that will happen in that conference. The ministry that will be going forth. Every session that will be happening. We, Brother Jerry Jones, who has just served the United Pentecostal Church International for many, many years in so many capacities. He is retiring as General Secretary of the United Pentecostal Church. And, and uh, I want, we want to pray for his, him and Sister Phyllis and their son. But we also want to pray for uh, God to guide the conference that will be gathered to, to know who that replacement should be in that key position in our international movement. So, uh, and the other positions too. Would you just, just once again take someone's hand and let's just pray for God's covering over this conference. Lord Jesus, this is an important time. This is a key time. And I'm asking you, Lord, I just feel you're wanting this church to intercede this morning. You're wanting this church to pray. We want you to have your wisdom and your way. We want your spirit to flow over everything that's done and your purpose, your purpose to be protected in every life that will be affected by this, Lord. I'm praying for every speaker that you would give them clear, strong direction, Lord, of what they are to minister and say at this conference, Lord every aspect in every department and every area lord i'm asking you to let this conference be so covered and anointed that we will all leave knowing that we have met together with you in such a powerful powerful special way lord in jesus name we pray thank you jesus thank you lord thank you lord thank you lord Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. And I have given you a visual through the floods and the waters that are covering so much of your country right now. And I would tell you, I want you to continue in prayer in intercession for the waters of my spirit to begin to flood your very metro Detroit area with the power and flow of my spirit that will just bring my glory to displace things that need to be washed away and washed out and to focus people on me and upon my spirit and that I may manifest my glory in a mighty powerful way throughout your entire city through the floods of my water of the word and spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, we honor you. We worship you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Turn to someone and say, our God is at work. I'm reading from Ezekiel. Chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. This was, I, I'm sorry, not Ezekiel, Exodus. Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. And I, uh, I want to just put this in context. Moses had been up to the mountain once already and uh, God had carved out with his own finger on the tablets of stone the uh, Ten Commandments 
and he had brought them down the mountain after 40 days and the children of Israel had fallen into a state of temporary apostasy actually. They were actually had asked Aaron to carve unto them a golden calf such that the Egyptians worshipped and they were worshipping in a way that gave no honor to God only uh, brought the passions of their flesh into the picture because you see that's what the devil does. Moses was so upset and so angry that he threw those tablets of stone down in his anger and broke them. And this was the second time now he had been sent up to the mountain and God had told him, if you read the earlier verses of this chapter, find two more tables of stone. And this time I guess Moses had to haul them up to the mountain with him. Boy, that was a little bit of a price to pay, wasn't it, for what he had done. But the Lord said, I'm going to redo it. Everybody say, God is merciful. I'm going to redo it. So Moses is up there and, and God says, I'm going to pass by. My presence is going to be so strong. I'm actually going to have to protect you somewhat from it. Uh, so we pick up the story at Exodus chapter 34 verses 5 through 7. So he, meaning Moses, cut out two stone tablets like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud. I'm reading from the NASB if you're wondering if it's not just exactly word for word like your King James you're looking at. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God. In one translation, it just has J-H-V-H, the Old Testament name of God that had no vowels, actually, that we have transliterated to Yahweh. That is really what NASB translates here, capital L-O-R-D. Anytime you see capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament, it's really standing for J-H-V-H. Everybody say, the Holy and Only One. The Lord, the Lord God. But notice how the Lord describes himself. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding. Would you say that with me? Slow to anger? And abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness for thousands. Now, when you just read this in some translations, you, you think that just means, oh, there's a few thousand that the Lord uh, shows loving kindness to. That's talking about thousands of generations, as other translations bring out. Who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And once again, that sounds like a contradiction in terms. He's going to do this, and yet he's going to do that. It almost sounds like it's contradictory until you understand and get into the study of the actual meaning of that. He's saying, I will keep visiting that iniquity on subsequent generations if they continue in the practices and pattern of their fathers. Aren't you glad we can break that pattern and choose not to follow in what generations before us followed? And then we are in the thousands of that. We put ourselves in the utter other category where he is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness. Psalm 86, verses 15 through 7, continuing reading in the New American Standard Bible. But you, O Lord, sounds almost like David in this prayerful psalm is reiterating how the Lord described himself to Moses in Exodus. But you, O Lord, 
are a God merciful and gracious. Say it with me. Slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Oh, grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your handmaid. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, O oh Lord, capital L-O-R-D, have helped me and comforted me. Anyone here been helped or comforted by the Lord in the past? Can we raise our hands and just praise Him and thank Him as we begin worshiping together in His Word today? Lord, I thank You for Your graciousness. I thank You for how You've helped me. I thank You for how You've comforted me. And not just me, but I get so thankful every time I see You helping and comforting one of my brothers or my sisters, Lord. I, I, I just thank You that you are that kind of a God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to preach to you on the subject, the awesome and amazing long nose of God. Did you say it with me? The awesome and amazing long nose of God. You may be seated. How many of you have ever heard about the fellow they're putting a picture up of right now? He is, he has a name called Pinocchio. How many of you have ever heard of Pinocchio? I think most of us at one time or another have heard of Pinocchio. We, we use that story of Pinocchio on our children sometimes. Amen, parents? Because we want them to to learn. Now, this is not exactly a spiritual story written by a necessarily spiritual man. But uh, the Pinocchio story is still pretty interesting because every time, are we getting those up? Every time uh, Pinocchio, well, how Pinocchio came about was a woodworker named Geppetto sees a falling star and he wishes that this puppet he just finished named Pinocchio could become a real boy. And, and in the night, he sees a, a blue fairy, according to the story, that grants Geppetto the woodworker's wish and then asks Jiminy Cricket to serve as the wooden boy's conscience. But the naive and trusting Pinocchio falls into the clutches of a wicked guy named Honest John who leads him astray to the sinful place called Pleasure Island. You can see there are some spiritual overtones to this story. But most of us know this story. If you'll go to the next, next pick. Most of us know this story by what you see right there. How many of you know where I'm going with this? Because the unique and interesting characteristic about Pinocchio was that every time he told a lie, what would happen? His nose would grow. Now, those of you whose wheels are already clicking in your mind are thinking, wait a minute, Pastor. You told us your title was the awesome an amazing long nose of God. Are you trying to imply, no, I am not? This would cause us, if we just followed the Pinocchio story, to think that of all the characteristics about God, since one of the two immutable truths about God, one of which is he cannot what? He cannot lie. How could we be talking this morning about the awesome and amazing long nose of God and Pinocchio in the same framework. Well, to understand this truth, we must understand, number one, that the story of Pinocchio's growing nose in the imagination of the Italian author Carlo Carlotti, 
who actually wrote about Pinocchio originally in the year 1883 that was set near an Italian village called Luca has nothing to do with the Word of God. Take a deep breath. And number two, a long nose in ancient Hebrew is an idiom meaning a wonderful and positive characteristic rather than a bad one associated with lying or speaking things that are not true. Recently, our Jewish friends brought to a close the Jewish year with a solemn celebration of Yom Kippur called the Day of Atonement. I read an account of a Messianic Jewish rabbi telling the story that at this celebratory event he attended recently over and over throughout the Day of Atonement services, the worshiping community would break out into a familiar song in Hebrew reciting the very words that Yahweh pronounced as he shielded Moses from the power of his own presence in Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7 that we read. One of the truly intriguing things that God declared about himself is hidden behind the English translation. God said, if you'll put up that next slide, God said that he was, say, Erech Apeim. Can you say that with me? You got to get that CH back in your throat. Erech Apeim. Let's say it again. Erech Apeim. And its literal meaning is, he has a long nose. Not something that you've probably ever thought about God before. But I'm introducing to you this morning that God says about himself in the Hebrew to Moses because we miss some things in translation. He says, Moses, I have a long nose. But Moses understands what God is meaning with this Hebrew idiom. Now, if you can't read Hebrew, don't feel bad. I can't either. But not many, this messianic, Rabbi said in attendance, even in the Jewish celebration of Yom Kippur, knew the meaning of what they were singing in that ancient Hebrew phrase. Because the phrase Arech Apeim means he has a long nose. What could that possibly mean in reference to God? Well, the answer is very simple and Actually, the English translation and some of the translations gets very close to the Hebrew meaning. And that's why I don't normally do my messages in the NASB. I usually bring them to you in the KJV or the Amplified. The Amplified would also agree with the NASB. But here it is at the bottom. Would you read it with me? The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious slow to anger. And that's the Hebrew, which means he has a long nose. That's what slow to anger means. The Hebrew idiom means that it's not just that God has a long nose, but what the translation into our understanding of God is, is that this God that we serve is slow to anger. Is anyone happy about that this morning? He is slow to anger. He's abounding in loving kindness and truth. He keeps loving kindness for thousands. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Actually, these descriptions of God's nature and character are repeated nine more times in Scripture 
in various uh, forms. Not everything said in Exodus is said every time and the nine times it's repeated. I showed you that when David's praying in that psalm, he repeats almost these very same characteristics of God. We see this awesome and amazing aspect of God's nature and character. Everybody say, God has a long nose. Which means he is slow to anger. He is full of loving kindness. And throughout the scriptures, we see this aspect of God on display again and again. We first see it in the garden. Because God had said, in the day that ye eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, ye shall what? Ye shall die. But when God comes Walking, as Brother Luke Levine preached to our young people at the rally a week ago Friday, in the cool of the day, and, and Adam and Eve go to hide themselves. They were hiding because of fear. They didn't know God had a long nose. They had no idea that God was such a compassionate God of loving kindness. But he demonstrates his, that aspect of his character of being slow to anger, be gracious and compassionate when he kills a, an animal and covers their nakedness up with the skin of the animal and says, so prophetically, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Then we see God's long nose at work again when Israel whom he had brought out of Egypt miraculously, opened up the Red Sea before them, then made the bitter waters sweet, then provided manna for them, and then provided water yet again for them and was meeting all their needs. And he watched them complain and complain and complain and complain, and he got to the place it took God, when you read the whole passage, it took the Lord a long time to get there because he has a what? He has a long nose. He is slow to anger. But he got to that place again. He said, Moses, would you just stand aside? Would you get over there all by yourself, Moses? Because uh, my nose... I told you how long my nose was before Moses, but, but this is getting a little ridiculous. And, and just stand over there. Uh, I'll start all over with you. I'll, I started with Abraham, but I'll, I'll start all over with you now because I, 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 I'm just out of patience with their complaining attitudes and spirits. And so Moses says, Oh, no, Lord, I am not going over there. You said to me you were gracious. You said to me that you are compassionate. You told me you have a long nose. You said that you are very slow to anger. So I am going to, to reverently but, but, but honestly speak back to you, Lord, because that's who you told me you were, that you would understand what I'm about to say. If you're going to wipe them out, wipe me out with them because I believe what you told me when you gave me the second tablet that you are slow to anger. And God showed himself slow to anger once again. Slow showed himself to be so compassionate toward his people. Then we see David, young man after God's own heart, young man with a heart for God who wrote, I don't know how many of those psalms he wrote on the hillsides while he was still unknown, just a shepherd boy watching his father's sheep Faithfully, I don't know how many of those psalms he wrote at that point in his life. I have a feeling some of them he did. And others I believe he wrote when he had found himself in great 
peril and Saul was chasing him and trying to destroy him. But in this particular psalm, the Lord is beseeched by David to, to remember me, O oh Lord. Please remember me. Stand up for me. If you read the whole psalm against those who, who are, are persecuting me. And, and then he reminds the Lord of what he had read and heard about what was said in the Pentateuch. He said, now Lord, I remember you said you are a God merciful and gracious. You are a God who has a long nose. You're slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. And I can't help but feel that David was saying that to the Lord when he was on his face. When Nathan the prophet had come to him and told him the story of what he had done, committing adultery with another man's wife and then sending that man to the forefront of the battle where he was pretty sure he would be killed because David now had found out that Bathsheba was expecting a child. And now the child has been born and the child is very sick and they don't know whether the child's going to live or die. They don't think the child is going to live. And, and David is, is so remorseful because Nathan the prophet has come to him and said, you are the one. You are the one who is guilty here. You are the one who, have, who has done wrong. And the Lord has, has seen this. And, and yet David just gets on his face before the Lord, and he reminds the Lord in his repentant prayer that the Lord is gracious and the Lord is merciful. The Lord has a long nose. He is slow to anger. And when the Lord takes the child, he does not get mad at God for it because he knows that the onus is upon him, but he also knows that he can say, create in me. Would you lift your hand and say it with me? Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Renew in me a right spirit. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Because, Lord, you have told us you have a long nose. You are slow to anger. When we mess up, we can come to your throne of grace. We can come and confess our mistakes and you are faithful and just to forgive us of our mistakes because you are a God who extends loving kindness and compassion to thousands of generations that will come to you and seek your face knowing how you have declared yourself to be. We continue to see this in the New Testament. When Jesus tells the story of two sons, one who was so faithful to his father, another that was just itching to get out on his own and do his own thing. And so he says, give me my part of the inheritance now, Dad. I, I, I don't want to stay here. And, and I, I just don't want to stay here on this farm or whatever it was. I, I, I don't want that. I, I want something else for my life. Give me my portion now. And he takes it and goes to a far country and he squanders it away in riotous living. Then he finds himself in a pig pen feeding pigs. You know what that means? How many of you know what that means to a, a Jewish boy? Not a good place for them to be he wasn't even allowed to eat the pigs, let alone now he's having to eat what was fed to the pigs if he wanted to eat at all. But he remembers something. I'm sure that father that loved him so much, 
I'm sure, Sister Hoover, that that father had told him the stories of the patriarchs, the story of Adam and Eve. I'm sure that boy had grown up uh, knowing the things of his heritage, his spiritual heritage. Wasn't even interested in them at that point, but now that he finds himself in this pig pen, he remembers... Because his dad had told him, let me tell you how God treated our forefathers. Let me tell you the miracles and the compassion he had all through history to our forefathers. Let me tell you about the nature of this one true God we serve. And I can't help but believe his father. It's not all in that parable, but the fact that he was a Jewish boy growing up in a Jewish household, he must have known and been told in Jewish idiom that God, this God we serve, is gracious. He's full of compassion. He has a long nose. He is slow to anger. And so the, the boy shakes himself and said, I'm really not worthy to be my father's son, even to be called my father's son anymore. But the servants on my father's land and that work his fields, they have a better life than I have. I'll just go back and see if maybe dad will be good enough to me to let me be a servant. But when he gets back, he sees the same attitude in his father, this parable, because that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, I have a long nose. I am full of compassion. I care about you. I will receive you even after you've messed up. If you will just humble yourself and, and come to me, I'm slow to anger and I'm full of compassion. About to wake her up. <sighs> and that's why. Let me just digress here for a moment and say, you want to be like the Lord? You want to be like Him? If we want to be like Him, then we're going to be full of compassion. We're going to be slow to anger. We're going to grow our noses a little bit, not literally and not through Pinocchio's method, but in trying to be like the Lord. We're going to extend grace. We're going to extend love. We're going to extend compassion. We're going to, going to refrain from a, a spirit of judgmentalism and, and, and inflexibility. And we're going to say, I want to be like my God. I want to have a long nose like God. I want to be slow to anger like my God. We go on down through the New Testament and, and we see that God continues to demonstrate His slowness to anger because He stops one day. Can't help but think, Brother Herring, that He had probably come out of that that uh, eastern side of Jerusalem, and you've you've come out of there, and you've 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 either come down the Mount of Olives, or I don't know if you went back up, but as you start walking up the Mount of Olives, you you just see Jerusalem laid out before you. You just don't even have to get very far up the Mount of Olives to to see it. It's all just laid out there before you, and and and. You, today you see the Dome of the Rock, but in that day you were seeing Solomon's temple. And, and he just stops. And he demonstrates his character again. Oh, Jerusalem! Jerusalem! How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks, but ye would not Jerusalem, you don't even know what I'm about to do for you. But I told Moses so long ago, and now I'm speaking of you today, Jerusalem. I am full of compassion. I am full of loving kindness. I have a long nose. Can you raise your hand and just thank? We've all stood in the need of that long nose 
of his slowness to anger. We've all stood in need of his compassions, but fail not. And he demonstrated it once again. This time the blood was flowing down both sides of his nose. And actually, when you read that in the Hebrew back in Exodus, and he says, I have a long nose, it's really plural. Wow. So the blood's flowing down the top, dripping off the tip of his nose and running down the sides of his nose probably by that time through the pressure and strain his body was going through, running out of his nose with the blood flowing from everywhere else. But he looks down at the very ones who had put him through this agony. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, because your God has a long nose. Your God is slow to anger. Your God loves you. Your God is for you. Your God is full of compassion. Your God understands you. He understands you in a way you don't even understand yourself. No, he does not wipe all sin under the rug. For those that will not come to him, there will come a day he will be the God of judgment. He will not excuse the guilty. But right now, we're in the day of salvation. Every one of us can come and meet the compassionate, long-nosed side of God. He deserved to be cut off. Three and a half Years he had watched the Lord work miracle after miracle. He had heard the personal and close teaching day after day of the Lord. And when push came to shove, he denied the Lord three times. And then even did it with cursing. And he felt like he deserved to be cut off. It's when he catches a glimpse of the Lord going from one part of the palace to another. From a distance their eyes meet. I don't believe Peter saw anger coming out of those eyes. You know why I don't believe he saw anger coming out of those eyes? Because... Jesus has such a long nose. He's slow to anger. I think what got Peter the most at that moment was he saw the love. Even after what he had just done, he saw the love flowing out of the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes out and weeps how? Bitterly. But I'm so glad that's not the end of Peter's story. <laughs> I'm so glad when he had just he had said, you know, I, we did all this, guys, but you know what? <sighs> Took three and a half years out of our life here. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm going fishing. Anyone want to come? That's what I know how to do well. And so, some of them go with him. I don't know if Peter had lost his fishing skills. I don't really think he had lost his fishing skills. <laughs> but there was something going on in the plan of God. I, you remember that time I first called you to me and I said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. We're going to have a reprise. So you're going to fish all night again. And you're going to catch nothing again. And I'm going to come up in my resurrected body and just shout out to you from a distance. Why don't you cast the net on the other side?
Uh, guys, I think we've heard that question before. Could, 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 could that be the Lord? And Peter must have stripped down with his guys trying to make it easier to fish because he puts on his fisher's coat and he just goes into the water swimming as fast as he could to one who still loved him. He saw that love coming out of Jesus' eyes. I'm so glad that, that the palace of Caiaphas wasn't the end of the story. Oh no. But now he gets to that shore and Jesus takes him aside one on one after feeding him some meat and they had caught a whole draught of fish when they cast the net on the other side and Peter knows without a doubt this is Jesus. He still loves me. He still cares about me. I don't deserve his love. I don't deserve this kind of mercy. I I don't deserve anything but his anger. But I've read in the Pentateuch he has a long nose so I'm going to swim toward him not run away from him. And Peter gets there and he experiences nothing but the compassionate loving kindness and mercy of our God. Can we just lift our hands to such a great God, such a great Lord, one that is so absolutely, unbelievably compassionate, one whose nose is so long that his anger is so slow. And there's Thomas. Everybody say the cerebral one. Cerebral one. Let's all say that. Cerebral one. That means one who operated a little too much from here and not quite enough from here. Let me tell you, we need to not be all here and nothing here, but we need not to be all here and nothing here. Everybody say balance. But Thomas must have been geared toward only wanting to, to approach the Lord cerebrally through his brain, through his natural brain. So, so when the disciples say, you, you won't, you, Thomas, you will not believe what we just experienced. The Lord appeared to us. He came right through the walls. And he, he talked to us. He's alive! Our dreams aren't dashed after all! But Thomas the cerebral one said, mm, what have you guys been smoking? No, he didn't say that, but he... He said, I think your emotions have run away from you just like those women who told us that they, they saw him. What have you become... Then we're not going to go there. And so the Lord makes an encore appearance just for Thomas. The others believed at that point. They didn't need an encore appearance. But he comes through the walls when Thomas is there. Thomas. Whew, can you imagine how he felt at that moment? I imagine he was looking for a place to hide. Don't you think you would have been? Because if he just came through the walls, he heard what you said to the other guys. I won't believe unless I can put my finger in those wounds in his hand and put my hand in that wound in his side. I will not believe because it does not make sense to my natural mind. Ay, 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 ay. Where can I hide now? You don't have to hide, Thomas. He's not mad at you. He understands your propensity to lean way too much on your natural reasoning and not enough from a heart full of faith. He, he understands that and he loves you anyway. And he's not ready to club you for it. Because Thomas, 
He has a long nose. He's very slow to anger. And so he says, Thomas, you don't have to hide. I'm slow to anger. Come to me, Thomas. You want to put your finger here? Put it there. Here it is. You want to stick your hand in my side? Here it is. Here it is, Thomas. Stick it in. I understand you and I love you as you are, but I just want you to have a little more balance. I want you to get a little more faith in your heart that doesn't all depend on what you can can't experience with your five senses and your natural reasoning ability. Let me just tell you something. In the kingdom of God and the work of God, it's got to be. It, you don't have to turn your mind off to walk with God. He'll sharpen your mind. He'll increase your abilities, your mental abilities. But he's also going to always have things about his kingdom that go beyond what can be comprehended and understood by the natural mind alone. That's why we are called people of faith. But God has a long nose. And so, Thomas, understand, buddy. Paul got it. He got it because he just couldn't help but inserting in some of his epistles from time to time. One time he says, I am an apostle. I, I can't deny my apostleship that I was called by God to be an apostle. But I'm the least of all the apostles because I persecuted the church of God. He hailed men and women, casting them into prison. Some of them probably died at Paul's Saul. Then he was called Saul of Tarsus at his hand. And now he's doing everything he can to build up the kingdom of God. So he writes toward the end of his last letter to the church in Thessaloniki that we call Second Thessalonians that we're reading right now. And he says in verse 3 of that third chapter, but the Lord is what? Faithful. And he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. All because he has a long nose. Would you stand? Amazing grace How sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. But that same grace all my fears relieved. And how precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, well, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when, when we first begun. Would you just come to this altar right now to just thank God that he has such a long nose.
the awesome and amazing long nose of God. So amazing. It's the reason any of us have any hope at all. It's not because of who we are or what we've done, but because He is who He is. And He's demonstrated that from the very beginning of time as we know it. And He has not changed. He is our compassionate, gracious God with a long nose. Oh my goodness, I didn't see you here. I want you to know you are so welcome here. We are so glad to see you back. We are so glad to see you back. We are so glad to see you back. Oh, God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes. I'm thankful that God has a long nose. How about you? So we sing amazing grace. Oh, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. Lost, but 